Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. The US natural gas markets have changed dramatically over the past decade. A decade ago, fortunes were won and lost trading natural gas, and the markets were crowded with investment banks, hedge funds, merchant utilities, and trading houses. Fast forward to now, and the markets look very different. Prices are low, and so is volatility. However, that might all change as the US natural gas market goes global and volatility returns through a variety of factors. To talk about the US natural gas market, we're joined by Pete Tuminello. Pete is Group President over all commercial businesses for Southern Company Gas. Pete, thanks for joining us. It is great to be here, Paul. When we look over the last decade in the US, the natural gas markets have been a tough space. I think in part that's been increased regulation, obviously markets becoming more efficient, but ultimately you've had this explosive rise in the production of natural gas domestically via via shale. And that has meant that prices have fallen, you know, a decade ago, bouncing around the $7 market mark to now around $2. And that's also decreased volatility. So overall, that's made it quite a challenge for the merchant gas businesses, the marketing and trading businesses out there. Can you perhaps give us a bigger picture of what your perception of the US natural gas markets have been over the last decade and some of the key sort of structural changes that have happened? Sure. You know, if we look back before 2010, a lot of the natural gas production, we were still uh, relying on offshore Gulf of Mexico. So when hurricanes would come through, they tremendously disrupted the natural gas markets. Fast forward to this last decade, 2010 forward, and with the advance of shale and and gas production really becoming a a manufacturing process, per se, if you will, um, you know, there's so much available natural gas that that can be extracted at a, a reasonable price you know you can look at uh, at the rate of return requirements at all the major natural gas basins and at two dollars and fifty cents you can drill a lot of gas at double digit rate of return so that really spurred tremendous investment tremendous capital coming into that space over the last decade so with that that drove an awful lot of production increases but at that time uh, the the commensurate build out of pipelines was not occurring um, in parallel with that production increase. So there were a lot of constraints that were developing in the market. So natural gas was getting produced, but in many cases in the Marcellus, Utica, out in West Texas, and even in the Bakken, there were many instances where the natural gas was being produced, but either needed to be shut in, flared, or sold at very low prices in order to get it to market because the pipeline infrastructure was not able to to keep, keep track. So depending on whether or not, you know, you were in a business that had downstream transportation in that space, that really uh, helped determine whether or not you're going to be uh, somewhat successful um, moving natural gas to market and be successful in the energy marketing and trading spaces over the last decade. So those who were really exposed to just the outright price of gas and the price of going down, and you didn't have a physical infrastructure and a logistics infrastructure to move that natural gas, that that may have caused more challenges uh, versus those who had a, a physical infrastructure and a logistics business that uh, that could focus on that over the past decade. That matches to you know when you look back a decade ago, you can see obviously the banks were big players. There was lots of hedge funds, and there were these incredible performances, P and Ls in the in the hundreds of millions. And then you look back over the last couple of years, you just don't see that anymore, right? There's just, there ha- it's really been the wallet, so to speak, has tr- shrunk dramatically for those kind of directional traders, those, those big speculative players. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I, I believe that, uh, you know, the, the businesses that focused on directional movement um, and, and commodity trading at liquid locations um, had, to, had to find a, a new business model, had to really think through that a little bit to see how they were going to thrive uh, and, and, and even survive in that market. You know, whereas those that were focused on moving downstream, moving towards the customer, holding some of the risk on um, the cost of the, the midstream assets, be it pipeline, storage, or LNG, they were able to, to, I believe, adapt a little bit quicker to that environment. And you can even look at, at mid-decade, look at 2014, 2015, when uh, the polar vortex occurred. 
when you held uh, pipeline capacity into constrained markets and you held storage that you could optimize on the grid and serve customers in those periods of time of extreme volatility, that business model worked very well, which is the one our company is involved in uh, versus the one that was really focused on on trading around uh, liquid locations and directional type trading. Yeah. Much of the volatility over the last decade has been driven not necessarily by sort of market events. It's been more, I guess, weather events. You, had that, you mentioned the polar vortex. So when these big dislocations happen, if you have the capacity and ability to move gas those last miles, serve customers, then that's when you could make significant returns. But you'd have to be very lucky to make a big play and a big call just on, on a directional trade and get it right, or you're as likely to get it right as you were to get it wrong. And we, you know, again, the polar vortex wiped out a number of, of hedge funds as well. I, I guess I want to zoom in a bit on that. So there have been merchants and natural gas businesses that have succeeded over the last decade. You talk about it's those that have built out a an infrastructure and the capacity to serve customers. Can you perhaps refine that a little bit for us? Which which strategies really worked over the last decade and which ones haven't? Well, I can speak specifically for um, our wholesale business, uh, Sequin Energy, where the strategy has been really serving both ends of the pipe uh, and the customers on both ends of the pipe, be it the producer on the receipt side of pipeline transportation or the power generation market, the municipal utilities, the industrials, the gas utilities on the delivery side of the market. So what we've really tried to do and the focus that I think uh, our peers who've been successful have done have really solved customers' problems. We've gone in to a producer and basically said, look, do you really need to go spend the money on buying downstream pipeline transportation to move your product to market? We're holding it in our portfolio. We can purchase your natural gas. We can move it to market and we can provide that service for you. Alternatively, if you do want to invest in that downstream pipeline transportation, we can optimize that for you and save you an awful lot of money and actually find premium markets for you because, you know, we have 150 professionals focused on that every day. And that's our job, whereas producers are focused on on drilling wells and go to the other end of the pipeline, go to the market, the gas utilities, the power plants. And I'll just use the power plants, for example. You know, a power plant is in the business of of building a a power generation station and generating electricity. They are not necessarily in the business of trying to determine what production basin they should be purchasing their fuel from, how to manage all the logistics from the wellhead to their power plant. And that could be hundreds or a thousand miles away. So in many cases, um, companies that have been successful have gone to power plants in this example and said, we can provide you that upstream service. We can bundle our pipeline transportation, our storage, give you a complete solution, allow you to focus on power generation. And and even this is a really important point. Many power generators have found that they have very difficulty, much difficult time finding natural gas on an hourly shape during the day, where in fact they could get dispatched more if they could find gas on the hour. When you have a very strong logistical presence and you can provide load shape very, you know, in a very uh, extreme way during the day, then you can help this power plant run more, generate more income, and you're actually solving a problem for them. So I would say the strategies that have worked in particular for our firm, where we've gone in and tried to solve a problem, tried to help our customers generate more income, generate more value for themselves. And we try to share that value with them through our solutions. We found that to be an effective strategy over the past decade. Yeah. And I guess the the thing that that kind of screams, because there's there's a couple of other organizations that have done similar and also done similarly well over the last decade, um, on average, that talks to scale, right? To be able to service that customer base, to service those producers, to move the gas around, you need to have it, it's scale in terms of pipelines, in terms of marketing capability, pricing capability, real-time gas dispatch, and so forth. Can you talk to that a little bit? And I guess that's where those sort of mid-sized players are also the ones that have struggled in the physical markets as well. They just haven't been able to compete with the big, large, dominant players. That scale ultimately comes from the owning entity or the entity's balance sheet itself. So that's a a real important point and, and a tremendous attribute for those who've been successful is having scale and having a balance sheet to provide the credit support for, for this type of business. 
you know, credit can be king in a, in a very volatile market. And if you've got the backing of a strong entity that's that's got investment grade credit, whether it's through uh, using their parental guarantees or some other credit sourcing, then your customers feel very confident in you. They'll f- they feel confident that you're going to be there for the long term um, and that you can bring very large transactions to them. So in, in terms of scale, we're now at about seven BCF per day. We're about number six in terms of wholesale size. And there are tremendous peers that we compete against. And I have a, a great deal of respect for that um, have that same scale. But what's interesting is our company is one of the only ones that is owned by a utility. So having that utility infrastructure, that utility credit backing has been tremendously important for us. And when we go and, and talk to gas utilities and try to solve problems for them and bring logistical expertise, asset optimization expertise, you know, we can basically say we are also owned by a utility. We provide these services for some of our own utilities. We understand your problems. We can help you get there. And plus, we've got this great credit backing, this great risk management system. Um, and, and that's key, just not only scale, but investment in your your, your systems is, is so important to capture your risk, capture your credit um, positions and P&L. All of those things are, are just a cost of entry to success in this business. Yeah. Why? And I recognize this is probably quite a prosaic question, but I think it's worth digging in a little bit. Why has credit mattered in so much in the last decade? Well, I think we've seen um, instances where uh, companies have had had defaults here and there or have exited because uh, natural gas prices um, have periodically screamed up. You know, if you have a hundred dollar price up in the northeast in a polar vortex event, if you don't have strong credit to serve that market and that's an awful lot of dollars that you're either having in your payable or your receivable account, you just you just can quickly be boxed out of that market if you cannot be there during the most volatile time. So it's interesting. I don't think you can go to an end use customer and say, you know what, we can be there for you with our credit support in a $2 or $3 market. But if if there's an extreme event and we have to serve you when prices are very high, but I have credit challenges, that's just, that's just not a good long-term, you know, solution for your, for your customers. So I just think with volatility, uh, still being in the market periodically, um, credit just just becomes tremendously important, especially if if you're trying to do very very large transactions. Because mm. we should also mention, allied to I guess this rise of these you know large organizations with scale, you've had this exit over the last ten years of the investment banks from the space. Some of them have exited entirely, no longer offering hedging services whatsoever. Some are. are in it, but you know, at a much smaller scale. How has that changed the natural gas space over the last decade? And what has that meant for the services that these large, your, your, you and your peers can offer? So that's a, a, an interesting point, because although the, um, the investment banks periodically have exited, sometimes they come back in, but then private equity has, has stepped up. Different private firms um, with credit backing have stepped up, and, and they provided a service in areas that, that we may not be as focused on. For example, um, let's say they want to go do a 10-year hedge for a producer or for an industrial market, um, and they, they're going to use their credit to do long, long-term transactions. Although we can do that type of work, that's where some of the, the, the banks and now private equity are, are, are focused. Where we're focused on logistics, we're focused on really optimizing the grid across all the nodes throughout the United States and Canada natural gas grid. So I, I think the, the market has certainly transitioned from uh, some of the banks exiting, but that's been picked up by either private equity or by the big producer marketers. But our focus has really been more on logistically optimizing the grid on behalf of our customers and generating value through, through that approach. You touched a little bit on risk and systems as well. I mean, lots of organizations or some organizations have exited the market, not because they wanted to, but because they've suffered such substantial losses that either their investors will no longer back them, you know, or the, or the entity is just not a going concern anymore. You know, that's happened periodically in the decade before the last one as well. Obviously, risk systems, cap CTRMs are really important. How has that changed over the last decade? Have they increased in import? Are they better systems available? What, what does that dynamic look like? 
So I, I believe that a system um, and, a, and a risk management approach to your business where that system is in sync with your risk management approach is absolutely critical. And in particular, where that system can do things in real time, it, it has to tell you in real time what your positions are, what your what your credit exposure is. And, and even at the end of every day, you know, what your, your P&L has been, you have to have that in real time because markets can move so, so very quickly. What we found to be very, very helpful in our system, and I think it's helped our traders and schedulers and everybody who's involved with the system every day, our risk management folks, we put out a report daily that captures any errors that someone may have done. And just human error, you may be entering a transaction And that transaction may have 30 or 40 deal attributes. Humans make errors. We pick those up every day. We track those. We provide all of our employees a scorecard of how they're doing, not to to, be punitive in any way, but try to help them, try to help them become better and better and better. So when you have a focus on making this widget of natural gas delivery and you're trying to make that widget 100 percent foolproof and, and without any errors, you have to have a system that captures that. So you can help your people get better and eliminate those errors and become uh, even better at what you do uh, every single day logistically. Yeah. And that also brings on, I think, to the final, what allowed organizations to survive over the last decade and thrive has really been culture. And I guess if you cycle back to 2010, there were a number of different approaches to the natural gas markets. And predominant at the time, I think in part spurred by the entrance of the banks and hedge funds, was the percentage of book, right? An individual book, the trader would get a take home a percentage of that, of his his or her performance. And it was very much sort of an individualistic approach. And there are still some of those organizations out there, and they're very successful. There's certainly fewer in number now. And they typically have very strong risk systems to be able to know exactly what's going on, like you're talking about. I think there's a commonality there. But it seems that on balance, those organizations that had a stronger team identity typically ran more global books or, sorry, or, or team books, more of a, a, as one approach to the market, you know, have been more successful, I would argue, in part because that type of setup promotes the right behaviors and also can prevent the kind of the incentives to perhaps take on extra risk than is allowed or get into positions that are taking too much risk because the payoff is so great for the individual. Can you talk a little bit to what you use across the market, how, how you think culture has helped organizations survive? Oh, I think that is absolutely critical and part of the, the secret sauce for many companies that are successful. You know, I can speak to, to what we've done. Um, you know, we believe that rewards should be shared. Successes, frankly, and failures should, should be shared. And we've, put together a program and have had it in place for 20 years where the value that gets created every year, a certain percentage of that gets shared with every employee. And and that's important. And and the reason it is, let's say you're working on a very large transaction where you're going to provide a a logistical um, natural gas delivery system for a gas utility that has 500 million a day of upstream assets, extremely large. You need your traders, your physical traders. You need the folks who are hedging assets long-term. You need your schedulers. You need your risk management people. It isn't just one person that is out there creating that value, right? It's a it's a whole team of people who are doing it. So, you know, it's interesting. I'll talk to my uh, my, my peers and other companies that, that have some of this percent of book. And throughout the year, they're having all of these arm wrestling matches, matches periodically of, you know, who brought in the value and, and where should that credit be? Well, we have that, that conversation just once at the end of the year. It allows us to focus during the year on creating value, serving customers, um, and, and being part of a team. And, and if we all row together, um, you know, we'll all get to the same place at the same time. If, if we're pulling oars differently, we're going to be going in circles. And, and, and you know, that visual is just one that, that I like to use because we have to pull together to, to get there together and, and to share together and, um, and, and periodically fail together. Um, and, and that's important where then we lift each other up, dust each other off, and, you know, and move on as a team. Um, so I don't discount the need to have that maybe um, ability to, to give folks individual 
uh, percentages of books for a business strategy that aligns to that. But that that's just not what we found effective. And, and we put together a more team approach. Yeah. And I think that's key, right, is matching incentive to the business goals. And obviously, at a pure trading house, that makes absolute sense. But for a, as you described, these organizations that have been more focused on servicing customers, building enterprise value, more complex businesses from an asset standpoint, got a lot more at work than just what the individual trader might be producing. And, you know, I'm sure we'll cover it in future podcasts as well. It's, there's always a bit of a challenge between, to use the jargon, right? What's alpha and what's beta? What was the system and what was the individual? But um, I feel like we've covered the, the last decade somewhat. Um, start looking toward the the next decade. There are significant challenges and opportunities available in the natural gas markets because of some significant changes that are going on. A big picture, to my mind, you've got on the production side with what's going on at the moment, there's the potential that a number of producers shut down or reduce production, private equity exiting. So there's also less investment, both the upstream and the midstream. And you've also got at the same time, though, as decreased, potentially decreased supply, you've got increased consumption on, on the horizon with both critically LNG hooking the US natural gas market up to a global market and also just the increasing use of, of natural gas for generation. There's also other changes over the next decade. But can you first, what's your take on, on the North American gas markets and what do you think are going to be the biggest drivers of change over the next decade? So it's, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. I think everybody's crystal ball is, is getting polished right now. And um, the way I would like to think through it is, is, you know, clearly LNG has been in play for a while. And we're at about 10 BCF per day of uh, LNG feed gas uh, going out primarily out of the Gulf Coast, but, but a few other projects, you know, throughout the country, but primarily Gulf Coast driven. So there's going to be a lot of infrastructure that is uh, continued to, to be built out in the Gulf Coast to serve the, the growing expansions for, for LNG, which means, you know, now you've got a market the size of several major, you know, East Coast cities now sitting in the Gulf of Mexico that is going to be attracting natural gas to be able to bring that to market. So all this logistical capability, logistical expertise is going to be, you know, critically important to serve, to serve that market as it goes forward. And again, these, these are going to be typically international players, some of which may have a trading entity that can provide all the feedstock themselves, but others are going to be looking for partners. And we've actually partnered with a few um, where we're going to provide all the upstream um, access to the lowest price natural gas. We're going to search for that lowest price gas on their behalf. We're going to manage the pipeline transportation to get it to the LNG uh, 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 facility and, and help in that regard. So that's one area. I think, too, is, uh, is gas-fired power generation. You know, it's interesting. The, the gas-fired power generation in the United States has been the single largest contributor to reducing greenhouse gases. And as much as um, many in the environmental community want to make natural gas now the, the new target, uh, become the new coal, I think the facts speak for themselves that natural gas, it, as it continues to replace coal, will be the single largest driver of bringing down greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., frankly, and across the world. So as more gas uh, fire generation gets built, there is going to need to be more obvious infrastructure, more logistical capabilities to serve that variable load, uh, both here domestically and, quite frankly, you know, overseas as well. And so when you combine you know, what's, what's going to be important for natural gas, that is in sync with, with what's important for the environment and how natural gas is going to help drive down greenhouse gas emissions, both in the U.S. and globally. And, and frankly, the, the backbone infrastructure that we have in the United States in natural gas is in, in a great position to be the backbone for things like hydrogen. We've already seen some announcements where companies are looking to co-fire power plants with natural gas and hydrogen. Well, you're going to need a, a delivery system to bring that hydrogen to market. You have a massive natural gas infrastructure system already that can be repurposed or commingled uh, where it makes sense and where operationally you can do it with natural gas and hydrogen. And I think that is going to be something that we have to be positioned to deliver and potentially even trade long term. Yeah. And I want to come back to, I guess, hydrogen and other decarbonization roles of the natural gas industry. 
Staying on the markets, though, one quick question first. Do you, was my statement about the potential of reduced supply, is that a valid statement? Is that, is, is that something that's seen as a real possibility? I, I think if it is, it's going to be temporal. Um, I think right now the, the market's having difficulty attracting capital to upstream space. Uh, I think that's uh, not only some environmental pushback, clearly, but low prices and, uh, and consolidation in the upstream space. I think as that settles out and as companies start seeing a, a potential move up in natural gas prices, that will reinvigorate, I believe, more drilling and more production in the United States. It almost has to. If the United States is going to be a global provider of natural gas to the world and LNG exports, we would likely see uh, an uplift in price over time, which should stimulate more, more oil and gas production. Now, that's got to be balanced with, like you said, the ESG issues that we'll talk about shortly. But, but I do believe our country is in great shape to provide much more natural gas over time for the world to help decarbonize. So, you know, uh, the markets will fix that issue. But you do have a significant expectation of you know, hooking up to the global gas market. Uh, we did, you know, our last episode was on China's increasing consumption of LNG, or at least noted that. So, you know, there's lots of places for it to go. Um, you've got increasing in generation. Is all this going to make the next decade the reverse of the last? So actually, we see natural pr- gas prices going back up and potentially see more volatility, all making it the potential that the trading opportunity for whichever entity is going to increase over the next decade. You know, if anybody can answer that question, they uh, they could really <laughs> solve solve uh, a lot of problems. But I'll give you my, my view. I don't know if it's going to reverse. I do think prices will go up slightly, but but markets move up and down. You know, based on a, a, a lot of factors, be it weather, be it supply and demand, domestically or internationally. I do believe generally prices will start moving up over time as market demand for natural gas, both domestically and internationally continues to move forward. Um, So I do believe that that's a good thing for long-term production. Now, we have to caveat that with uh, what's going to happen in the ESG space and how quickly the market's going to want to leapfrog natural gas. I I personally believe the more immediate benefits, both commercially to to countries outside of the U.S., is to bring in low-priced natural gas, and also it helps those countries decarbonize or lower their GHG emissions the quickest. But the world's going to be figuring that out over time, co- combining commercial and decarbonization opportunities together. Yeah. I can tell you one thing from from my seat is that um, you know if we do see an increase in demand for natural gas traders and associated talent, right from risks through to finance, through to operations, you're going to see a lot of volatility in that space because – one thing the last decade has meant is that fewer organizations have been engaged in natural gas marketing and trading activities. That means that there has been fewer seats, so fewer people, and certainly a lot less investment in new talent coming through. We see a pretty significant talent gap already um, from a slightly, you know, a, a growing but renewed interest in natural gas markets and trading and marketing them because of this expected rise in prices and volatility. So it's going to be interesting to see where actually those people come from. And I know you know you see the same your side, right? It's still a lot of the same faces in the market with relatively little investment in, in the next generation. Well, you know, that's interesting. Um, we, we have a, a little bit different approach to that. We have probably 30 fairly young uh, folks uh, out of school in our logistics and operations team. Because our fundamental belief is to learn the natural gas market, to learn how to trade it, you really need to learn how to dispatch it and logistically move gas from point A to point B or, or over time X to time Y. And, and so our investment in, in younger folks uh, right out of college uh, to join our logistics and operations team has, has been quite good. What also we're finding in that young generation, it isn't just about coming in and having a commercial opportunity long term. They want to understand what your company is doing in the community. What is your position on social justice? Do you have employee resource groups that they can be part of and and do more than just come in and and do their job every day? So being part of a a big corporate entity uh, at Southern Company provides us that capability to attract 
some young folks where we get them both um, operationally uh, educated in natural gas, but then also provide some of those things they're looking for um, outside of just their day to day job. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you might want to keep that quiet about uh, if you're one of the few organizations investing in, in new talent. Um, but I certainly commend you. And I think that, uh, you know, that's going to be a real crucial competitive advantage. If these markets pick back up um, because very few organizations have actually done that. And the other thing to say as well is that you've got, you know, this drive towards using technology to reduce costs, to automate systems, to use, you know, um, to reduce headcount, you know, and I look back at, a decade ago, a, a, a natural gas desk focus say in the Northeast would be two traders, a term and a, a cash trader, bank of operations people, you'd have a mid marketer and an originator. Now that's very much reduced down to one or two people because of how technology has enabled um, aspects of, of trading. So it's not like as well, you've got many academy-like positions where you can really train people in the fundamentals of the physical natural gas market. So I think that's also a challenge. That very much can be. What we have also tried to do is put together that analytic fundamental team that's sitting right next to our physical logistical traders and schedulers. So they're really scouring the market every day for flows across the grid to understand you know, what's happening at every single pipeline interconnect, what's happening at every single meter at every single power plant to really understand what's happening in the market every day and have this team approach that we're sharing that information and we can make these logistical choices every day and these financial choices, you know, every day across the, the broader team. So we probably still have some of that traditional analytic uh, schedule, scheduling trader all together in a pod in a team by, by region. And have found that uh, that using technology, both with our systems, but also in understanding the daily fundamentals of the market, um, has been very helpful uh, in serving customers and extracting you know the value out of the gas grid every day. Well, this comes back to that scale point. Where, you know, while you've had a lot of transparency enter the market over the last decade, having scale generates a lot of data, and we discussed this with Simon Collins recently. Um, on a previous episode, that's a huge amount of data that can form the backbone of a competitive advantage when you start applying that analytics and digesting that information to give you those insights that aren't available to anyone else in the market. Exactly right. And, you know, we're looking day ahead of what weather is doing and what data uh, is telling us around what do we think our customers customers are going to be calling for the next day. But what's interesting, you know, that data isn't isn't always completely accurate. So you have to understand, you know, what's underneath it. For example, how is the ISO going to dispatch a power plant? And is it going to dispatch it day ahead or is it going to dispatch it during the day? And what assets do you need to hold to maybe serve uh, some of the market that's going to need to be balancing the electric grid with natural gas every day? So data is tremendously important. But, you know, we found, you know, it, it's good and it's critical to, to watch. But um, a lot of days we have to just respond to what the market says it needs because our predictive capabilities, you know, can't always be accurate. We touched a couple of things there. So you probably it's going to be an interesting market. Could be this talent shortage, potentially. You mentioned we have decarbonization going on, whether it's, I guess, government sponsored or not. Certainly to be able to attract talent, to attract investors, it's, it's going to be crucial to companies' strategies to include that, you know, on a local and a global basis over the next decade. Can you give us some, I mean, outside of obviously the, the natural gas being a, a better fuel for the environment than coal in terms of generation, can you talk to what you see some of the natural gas players' role in decarbonization? And I'm particularly interested, you know, our discussions prior to this with RNG, hydrogen. Can you talk a little about what those actually are? Particularly RNG, I think you know, there's a general awareness on the hydrogen front, but can you talk a bit about yeah, renewable natural gas? Sure. You know, so renewable natural gas has been around for a while from um, landfills that emit methane into the atmosphere that, you know, that, that methane needs to be captured, put into a pipeline and either generate power or, or uh, on site or move to a pipeline uh, to, to bring to market. That is expanding in interest across the United States, most utilities, including ours, are saying, we want to invest in our local communities, the local farmers who um, have tremendous herds of, be it cattle or, or other livestock, where methane is emitting into the atmosphere, and you can capture that methane and bring it into your utility system. And really, from a, from a, 
decarbonization perspective uh, quickly uh, impact the the capabilities to to decarbonize in your local utilities. So I know our gas utilities have launched an RNG team to look to build our renewable natural gas assets in and around our gas utilities throughout the East Coast and, and up in the Midwest. So um, I think there are a lot of companies focused on RNG as a commercial business where you can go sell those environmental attributes primarily into the low carbon fuel standard market in California. Our approach is really looking at RNG as an investment to capture um, methane that is in agricultural uh, type of uh, businesses and, and put it in our pipeline, decarbonize, uh, get rid of methane as a powerful greenhouse gas. It's you know 20 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas contributor than, um, than CO2 and, and also have an investment opportunity for our utilities. So I would say there's going to be a, a bit of a run on talent for those who have built and operated renewable natural gas facilities. Now, the flip side is these are small. An average RNG project might be 200 MCF per day, you know, very small, but its decarbonization capability is quite large because it's moving all that methane out of the atmosphere immediately. But I think we have to be really honest about it from a volumetric perspective. It probably won't move the needle all that much, but from a volume perspective, but from a decarbonization perspective, I believe it will. Yeah. One more point on that, on the ESG side is... A lot of the U.S.'s capacity to be a real player in the, in the global gas market is going to be tied to it being the low-cost producer. A lot of that will be increasing the transmission of gas from these uh, from the Permian and et cetera to the Gulf Coast and elsewhere. Pipelines are um, can be challenging to get built. You know, what's your sort of comment around that over the next decade? Do you see um, much infrastructure being built, or do you think that um, it's going to be a challenge. Wow, that is uh, that is going to be a tremendous challenge as we go forward. And um, you know, some of it uh, are things that pipeline companies could have probably done better over time. And some of it is just the the movement in um, in the environmental world to to get natural gas potentially you know out of the system quicker. I would say uh, pipeline companies are doing a very good job down on the Gulf Coast in Texas really uh, getting these pipelines permitted, built, and trying to partner with their communities to, um, to really have a lot of discussion up front around the environmental social justice type issues that, that really need to be attended to before you build a pipeline. But let's face it, people do not want pipelines in their backyard. They, they just don't. And, and you have to find a way to use the eminent domain capabilities that are out there to be able to go in and, and first try to negotiate with landowners and get them to, you know, sell out their, their right of ways in an appropriate, you know, commercial terms. But if not, you have to then go down the path of eminent domain. And then that leads to a lot of legal challenges. You're seeing that a lot in the Northeast. Um, and you're even seeing that needing to be solved by upper levels of, of courts, even up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I think the U.S. Supreme Court recently had to get involved with a big Northeast project to determine even what government entity had the right to issue permits. I believe the U.S. Supreme Court will be taking up more cases around eminent domain over time. So this is difficult and it, it's not going to be solved easily. But I do believe that pipeline companies, if they get more and more engaged upstream and in, in working on environmental social justice with landowners and really working towards joint solutions, um, they can advance a little bit. But at the end of the day, I think folks just really don't want pipelines right near their backyard. And that's going to be a challenge. Yeah. I've got another tough question for you. Um, so over the, over the last decade, uh, we talked about how scale matters um, and actually being owned by utility has been a, a benefit in terms of the credit rating that you have. Do you see that being the same going forwards or is there going to be a benefit to organizations that are perhaps more, um, dare I say it, sort of nimble, fleet footed to, to capture these market opportunities? Well, I think there's certainly place for both. And, and again, our strategy is focused on helping customers, you know, reduce their costs, solve their problems, help them manage risk, uh, take work off their plate by not having them have to focus on the upstream assets. In our particular case, um, since we've been part of a big utility, you know, we have the ability to bring a lot of other uh, tools to our customers. We have separate subsidiaries that are involved 
in distributed generation. So if a data center um, is looking for energy, electricity, and they want to buy wind, solar, and have a backup um, renewable type uh, or low carbon backup uh, power generation supply because data centers just can't ever lose power. Well, we have at Southern several subsidiaries that we can package together and go solve that problem for them. You know, we also have, um, we manage and operate the, the national um, carbon capture uh, facility in, um, in Alabama, which is a Department of Energy uh, sanctioned facility. So if customers want to understand about carbon capture, we can bring in, you know, really uh, highly educated practical scientists who are solving this problem. Well, they're studying it and they're, they're attempting to solve it and, and drive it more commercially where carbon capture can be something, you know, customers can look at. And then we have a whole R&D effort at Southern around hydrogen right now. So if our uh, customers are looking to bring hydrogen into their system, we can provide those resources. So I definitely don't want to take away from those who are nimble, small, and not part of a major entity because they, they, are, they are quite capable of, of being part of this great natural gas market we're in. I'm just you know suggesting that if you're part of a bigger entity and you have more tools to bring, especially as we move towards these ESG uh, uh, drives that every company has, uh, we find that, that that is effective. Yes, as you say, it's, uh, there's, there's plays for both. Final question, <laughs> get your crystal ball out. Do you think the next decade is going to be a, a great decade for natural gas trading or, a, or another challenge? Oh, wow, boy, that's tough. You know, it, it, is, it is going to be opportunistic. And there are going to be, I think, years where when there's weather and volatility, um, it will be good for natural gas trading. The last couple of years where there's been really no winter and prices have been flat across location and across time, those are challenging years. So I believe what's going to happen is as it's getting more difficult to build pipelines, but we're going to have more production, I believe, come into play. I believe that volatility could pick up a good bit um, because this natural gas is going to have to go somewhere. And if new pipelines aren't being built, and there's going to be a bit of a, a bit of an arm wrestling for that pipeline capacity that's out there. So if you have pipe in the ground right now, um, or you own long-term pipeline contracts uh, in areas where production is going to increase, that is a good thing for your trading and logistics business, uh, I believe, over the next decade. But again, I believe it's very difficult to um, say, I'm going to have these earnings that are going to go up by X percent a year, and you can bank on that traje trajectory in a natural gas trading business. Those earnings are going to be up and down based on weather, based on price volatility, um, based on the needs of power generators. Um, and so it, if anyone can draw a straight line or a line of increasing earnings over the next 10 years and, and take that to the bank, that is going to be very difficult to do in this business. I do believe it'll be opportunistic and I do believe there'll be some very good years over the next decade. It's really interesting you say that actually the returns profiles of these natural gas merchant businesses, you know, they, they aren't a steady incremental growth story each year. You know, they are, um, it's volatile. And actually, you know, you can probably come up with a reasonable sort of low end estimate of what you might make. But really, it's about being there and present to capture these events, whatever they might be, or market opportunities where you can get deliver these outsized returns. And in some ways, you're better off looking at the returns of a trading business over a a five or 10 year period than you are on just an annual basis. But that does make, make it quite hard to find the right backers, the right investors, you know, where you don't have that typical returns profile, at least say private equity expects or many, many shareholders expect. Yeah, Paul, that's, that's important to, to, to really note Th this, uh, this type of business in energy trading and logistics. Um, it, we can say at our company, there's this minimal level of, positive income we can generate every year. But we believe we're there for the upside opportunities when they come and they come maybe every couple of years. And over time, when you look at that in aggregate, are we generating the returns that our investors expect? And in our case, are we generating returns that are far greater than what we, what we can generate through our um, utility ownership, which we have done? But, um, but that also always needs to be you know, reassessed and, and this business is not one that you can say every single year, I'm going to deliver this exact amount of value, but it does have to be looked at, I, I believe, a bit over time. Right. And I guess we're saying that the frequency of opportunities to capture the upside should increase as the U.S. natural gas market gets more exposed to the global market and 
weather events or whatever it might be at that scale? Yeah, they, they absolutely can. And that's what we haven't seen yet is the, the volatility that can come from uh, demand increases uh, at the LNG facilities and then, you know, demand decreases and what's going to happen when, when that natural gas has to go somewhere into storage. We have not seen the full effect of that yet. And when that volatility kicks in again, primarily on the Gulf Coast, that should add some opportunity for those who have focus and assets in, in those areas, which which we're focused on as well. Fantastic. Well, it's been a really interesting discussion and a good journey through the, I guess, um, the last 10 and the, the future 10 years in the natural gas business. Um, and we really appreciate you coming on, Pete. Absolutely, Paul. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.